Hello and welcome to We've Been Watching, a TV review podcast with Claire Woodward and me, David Stevenson. Hello. Hello. I've just Hello. had the COVID <laughs> vaccine, so if you hear a thud, it's me. Oh. <laughs> Did they warn you about the allergies? What are you supposed to be allergic to? I mean, you know, I, 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 cause I'm reading my little card today and it says you might feel drowsy or drop dead or something. They ask you about that. And they ask you if you've done any foreign travel in the last two weeks. And I would, I would say, <laughs> chance would be a fine thing. Everybody laughing at the same jokes made by everybody turning up, which I thought was great. <laughs> and allergies, oh, like I think hay fever was one of them. That was the most boring one probably they'd ever heard. I mean, I, I wanted something a bit more exotic, but on the spot, couldn't come up with anything. But um, it well, was they, they get through you. Risk. Good, they get through you by the sound of things as well. So I suppose they just the same jokes are quite handy, aren't they? Yeah. How's your TV yeah. TV watching week been, Claire? Um, well, it's been Meghan and Harry wall to wall, hasn't it? All the way on every programme with with lots of people saying to beautiful young mixed race women, how do you feel about everything on every possible news bulletin? Um, and I think Oprah Winfrey is probably the only person in the world who's smiling after this really isn't she she's thinking about the money yeah i think her bank balance has done really well out of this but um when i watched it i got about 35 minutes in and i thought i think i'm gonna to have to go to bed i don't know it was the <laughs> sheer excitement of it that just sort of catapulted me upstairs i i couldn't couldn't go on with it i really didn't like the style of it because it felt you know with the greatest respect to our american friends it felt very american and very cozy so i just couldn't i couldn't take it initially and then i finally got back into it when when harry appeared but um it the style of it what did you think of the style of it well it was as you say it was very bland very american and by the way on the television note did you realize these chairs and tables in the garden were made by uh, were made by a company owned by um, one of the brady bunch kids Oh, well, that is a great reference. The Brady Bunch. Oh, well, I like, yes. it, even, I like it even more now. I thought that was a great story bad. of a man called Harry. Yeah, that kind of thing. Um, but presumably it was done with an eye to international sales, wasn't it? You know, as bland as possible. There was as little visual distraction as possible. Um, so as not to offend anybody. I mean, I think it was done, you know, it was sort of Janet and John interviewing, wasn't it? I mean, Oprah's a very good interviewer. Um, but the but Harry and Meghan, she knew they were going to spill the beans anyway. Did it feel rehearsed um, to you? It felt like it felt like she knew the answers that were coming, and there was a bit of media training on the other side. And mm, her reactions, mm. her reactions seemed quite predictable. The shocking reactions of hands in the air, you know, face lighting up as if, oh my God, I've got a story here. But I mean, that's either very clever of her or it was spontaneous, but it's that's the sort of style of stuff that, I mean, I don't think we, do we have interviews like that in this country? I don't think we do, really. I think we have more Rottweilers. I mean, you know, she she was no Emily Maitlis, was she, with Andrew? Uh, I mean, don't forget Oprah, she's been an actress as well, hasn't she? She was in The Colour Purple or something. So, you know, Oprah's, you know, when she, when Megan talked about the discussion about Harry's uh, and her baby's how dark it would be when Oprah went, no, it was a bit, it seemed a bit stagey to me. Perhaps they'll do a soap together, the two of them, a daytime soap. It would be fabulous. <laughs> the winds, oh, we've already got the winds, haven't we? It's got Harry Enfield in it. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, it was soapy. And as you say, you know, when Harry came in for da, 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 part two, um, and he started reeling back a bit, you know, because Megan was all, oh, yes, this, this, and this, and Harry was, well, I, 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 yes, it did happen, but I can't say who. So he was like the sort of disappointing gossip, wasn't he? I know, it was a weird structure, wasn't it? I wonder why they had that structure, Well, they had it with Harry just popping in later. I mean, was who was who was meant to be top billing here? That was the weird thing. Was, <laughs> was, it, was it meant to be Megan, you know? Was it meant to be the Suits actress, you know? I mean, her acting skills, if she was deploying them, and let's give her the benefit of the doubt, mm. were, were great. I mean, you've got, to, you've got to give it to her and quite measured at points as well. But isn't that the difficult thing about this interview, to separate what is really the story and the truth of that story with the whole style of it? 
Um, well, I mean, you know, this is why Oprah's a millionaireess, isn't it? You know, she's the she's the woman that America and the world opens up to. So presumably, you know, the planning for this program was absolutely done with military precision. You know, ask this here, gasp here, Harry will come on to be the the starter, and blah blah blah. I mean, I'd have loved to have known what the negotiations were to do, you know, to do the program, wouldn't you? Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's pages long. And the fact that most of it was on neutral ground or what they called a friend's house, I thought that was interesting. Or someone who lived in the same road, apparently. I mean, I imagine they're not <laughs> popping around and getting a cup of sugar in that sort of road, are they? Sort of well, send I your funky PR see... around. <laughs> I did expect to see your barbecue in the background, David. I thought they might have gone round to your house, but, <laughs> um, you know. Happy to but do yes, that. Happy, got... happy to entertain Archwell. Yeah, for the for the round for round two, maybe you can have Camilla and Charles go. It did not say that uh, in your garden. Not but I you. noticed that Archwell is behind because Archwell is a content media company now, and and they will be producing all of the TV shows that are going to come out from Netflix and the audio stuff for Spotify. So I really feel that by the end of the year, we're going to get the start of some sort of reality show. Centered around that chicken coop, I would imagine. <laughs> That's great. You know, there'll be lots of collecting chickens, won't there? And but they won't be eating them by the by your barbecue. So uh, that's that's a bit of a shame. But yeah, I mean, I we haven't heard the second part of the Spotify podcast, have we? They released that one at Christmas. It was just celebrities saying, "Lockdown's a bit crap, isn't it?" Yes, Elton John. Thanks very much. Um, so I don't know what the, I I just you know all they have to sell is the reality series, isn't it, David? All they have they to sell do. is themselves. I don't. I see. It's interesting where they're going to go from here because they've really given us the best insider stuff they've got, haven't they? The two greatest stories they've already put out there, um, the racism um, and other things. But I mean, really those, those stories are probably the most bankable. I mean, what are they going to talk about next? I mean, I just thought the only thing they can end up, she talked about Zooming the Queen, didn't she? Or fan <laughs> the Queen. Maybe she'll have to Zoom <laughs> next time and... <laughs> We'll look at the well, queen having a boiled egg or something. I mean, what, I mean, how 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 could this reality show actually take form? I wonder. Well, I mean, I'm just I'm just liking the idea of the queen on a Zoom call because you know you'll be thinking, well, she won't be having any books on her shelves like you, David, and you've got a globe there. I noticed, so you know, she won't be as interesting as you. She'll just have tatty carpets and footmen going, oh, this carpet's a bit threadbare. But yeah, what's going to be in it? I mean, are people got want to you know, are their friends going to buy into their world? Are they going to see music produce, international music producer David Foster in the background popping around for a cup of sugar? Or, um, you know, who else are their friends? They're, they're, they're kind of everybody, aren't they? Because everybody in Hollywood will want to know Meghan and Harry. So, yeah, they've got dynamite on their hands if you've got the real housewives of Montecito County, haven't you? Yeah, absolutely. And the Kardashians, well, I got something through the other day. They're on their last series. So, they can fill that void. That's a rather large void, sort of several voids, isn't it's, it? It's a rather it's large a... bum-shaped void, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what are the people who watch the Kardashians? They, they'll, they'll come to something like that with the most ridiculous expectations, won't they? Yes, I mean... What do people move on to when they finish watching the Kardashians, I wonder? I mean, it, it won't be, I don't know, maybe it's Bridgerton, but it won't be War and Peace, will it? But, I mean, they There's an eternal void, isn't there, for um, programmes like that? And and particularly, um, you know, we, we they have to regionalise, you know, the Real Housewives of of, um, of uh, Bolton, everything in this country, whereas you've got an international package ready made, haven't you, for the for the for the Montecito duo? Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, Oprah will just be the bank balance. Oh, oh yeah, exciting totally. and amazing. But they'll have to come up with something a little bit concrete, won't they, Harry and Meghan? I mean, to really make it fly again. Although um, people people are satisfied with David, just a little bit, that... and they do inspire a lot of love on social media as well as quite a bit mm. of dissent, frankly. Well, I mean, that's what everyone's looking for, isn't it? You know, the social media love. I mean, I think people, you know, they commission people, don't they? As you know, uh, do you want a series? How many Instagram followers have you got? 
you know, influencers are getting on Strictly Come Dancing now, aren't they? So that's a big, that's a big thing, isn't it? I mean, also I was thinking, um, uh, they're very big on mental health, aren't they? But how entertaining can you make a program about mental health? Yeah, that's going to be tough. You know, it's them. not, it's not yeah. terribly fit. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. And it really is like, you know, my mental health is terrible. And it's like, well, yes, but you're lo lots of money and you're in a really big house. How do you, How is it going to be for the rest of us? Yeah, I mean, it's tougher than that. That issue is tough to put across on television, isn't it? I mean, there's only, mm. one, there, it's only one way of doing it. You know, there's no, you know, this, there, isn't, there isn't a lighter side of this. It's a, it's a difficult, serious issue. So the stuff is going <laughs> to be... The lighter side of going round the bend. Oh the God, lighter God. side of mental health isn't going to be the subject. It's not going to be the title of it, is it? Um, so how many stars How many stars are we giving? Um, I don't know whether we're doing stars, but we could do stars. I mean, I don't know whether... Let's do stars, yeah. Let's do stars. I mean... I, I have to say, I did stay up and watch it on Facebook, and there were some amazing revelations. I mean, I would give it four just for wow content, but really, you know, they 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 certainly need um, you know the, the young generation dancing in the background for me. Yeah, I mean, I give it a solid exciting. four star. I give it a solid four stars because I was asleep by the end of it, but not in the same room as it. So, I mean, I think uh, <laughs> a solid a solid four stars. And, and, you know, it's a great entree for what is yet to come. Yes, I think so. I mean, I look forward to uh, them inviting us on their uh, on their podcast to show to, you know, so we can show them how it's done, David. Yeah, absolutely. Well, let's re <laughs> let's return to the sort of the pedestrian UK and what they're doing on television, shall we? <laughs> Yeah, let's do that. Let's talk about um, a very uh, sort of sexy and dynamic couple on Sunday night on ITV, McDonald and Dodds, who are probably, you know, um, a little bit less interesting. They are. Or but a lot less interesting. Yeah. But they're the only they're the only detective duo we know with a catchphrase. I think they are. That is the only it's something to do. It's not on your bandwidth. Is that the catchphrase that we're meant to? That that does that does appear to sort of you know indicate that you know pedestrian Dodds played by fantastic Jason Watkins is. Um, is not hip to the tip, Daddy O. Uh, you know, he wears a beige raincoat whilst doing his detecting, and um, he eats lots of pie and chips. <laughs> Sounds great to me. But he's not, he's not with it. Whereas his partner um, is he, she's his superior, isn't she? She's yeah, the sergeant. she's DCI to his um, yeah. sergeant, isn't she? But I mean, what's interesting, yeah. and I've been uh, I've been writing about this. He doesn't have a Christian name, does he? He is. Um, he is DS Just Dodds. Dodds, which um, I mean, a bit of a nod to Morse, but I did. But I was thinking whether Morse had a catchphrase, I don't think he really did. I think it was let's go to the pub, Lewis, used to be his catchphrase. <laughs> Lewis, that was his catchphrase, wasn't it? But I mean, I think with it, they, you can see what they've tried to do with McDonald and Dodds, they make they're trying to make a star out of Bath, aren't they? Uh, the sort of honeyed, honeyed, um, would, um walls of bath as opposed to oxford yeah absolutely and, and haven't they, uh, and yeah. haven't they uh, well what what's interesting is of course the other thing that's been shot there is bridgerton so by sheer chance yeah. itv has sort of stumbled or or bridgerton has stumbled into bath and they're both winning from it aren't they i mean it does it does look fantastic on the screen doesn't it donald mcdonald and dodds i mean much like morse in a way really. it does well, I mean, but the you know, I, I just found it quite heavily referenced because this week's episode was about a, a sort of girls' weekend away in Bath, and then you got Sharon Rooney eating a Bath bun and explaining what a Bath bun was, as opposed to a Sally Lunn bun, which I shall be attempting to eat later in the episode. Um, sorry, that's an Edinburgh accent, not a Glasgow one. So you know, they're quite heavily lathering on, uh, you know, the sort of regional stuff like butter on a Sally Lunn. Um, which, which is fine, and it was a it was just workman like drama, but I didn't um, I didn't warm to it for some reason, and I think two Did hours. You not, not to not, so, something. That's interesting because I, I I think the quality of it, if there is there, we can talk about that. But I mean, it's the story. I think the story. I find the story is quite hard to pick, really. And you know, as someone who sort of you know morning, noon and night is watching detective dramas. I mean, you get used to about halfway through <laughs> checking off the normal checklist of, you know, um, most most well-known guest star tick and you you work from that 
you work from that basis. But I find that I find the writing quite clever. Yeah, I, I guess so. But I just didn't get the, you know, the what's the thing about these two detectives? What's the, you know, Dobbs is the one who's, you know, who's a bit old and a bit, you know, not with it. And McDonald is the young woman and 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 oh they've got a boss is it uh, who's played by um uh, is it some young james guy. murray is it james, no, is it james, murray? james murray yes in the in form-fitting police outfit don't know why i noticed that but so you've got him but there's just it's it's just not very it's not very deep but now you've mentioned that we don't know Dodd's first name i want to know all about him now i want to know about his home life and his family and where he gets his anoraks from it's the, that's the that's the really deep mystery of the show, isn't it? But when you compare it with something like Death in Paradise, I think it's better than something like Death in Paradise, where I think the writing has suffered a little bit down the ages that it's been. It feels like ten ages of man since Death in Paradise started. But um, it, I think it's a I think it's a cut above it's a cut above that. But you're right, there isn't really that much of a relationship between the two. She's like a sort of picky auntie or something, isn't she? Sort of prodding mm, given. Mm complaining about him having butter on his chips and, you know, replacing it with margarine. I mean, <laughs> was that the most sort of tedious bit of television this week? Well, was the other catchphrase, wasn't it? Here's some margarine. I like that. Yeah, that's fabulous. <laughs> but yes, there's, there's kind of not much to it. You know, they're a nice pair. It's a nice relationship. But it's just like, you know, somebody liking their colleague. But, you know, I mean, I thought this week John Thompson would have done it because he was the leading, you know, the, the best known actor in it, I thought. But, um, and yeah, I liked he, all the references to his Bard Kingdom yeah, Brunel. It brought in a bit of history television, which I enjoyed. That was the most interesting stuff about it. I mean, I was more interested in that tunnel than most things, to be frank. <laughs> yeah, bring back, we should get Tim Dunn to do a series on um, historical murders in train tunnels for the Yesterday Channel. That, that, that'd be my ideal programme, I think. You know, based on Let's dam walls or viaducts, <laughs> the old murders on viaducts. I mean, we've had, uh, yes. M murder on concrete. There you go, David. <laughs> That's the next one. Put that well, I can see you're going to you're not going to give a very high you're not going to give a very high score for poor old Donald and Dodds, are you? Well, I mean, I think I think really it's because I've spent some of the week watching old endeavours, and frankly, yeah. Nothing compares to you, Endeavour. So I'd give it a three. Solid Sunday night viewing, but nah. I'll give it four, just because I know ITV love it so much and they've held back the third episode. I don't know why they're holding it back. For God's sake, give us what you've got on this, you know. I mean, we've got precious little to watch anyway. I mean, but anyway, the third episode mm. of the series, that's the other... Uh, ongoing mystery, I'm afraid, is when that's going to turn up. So all right, I'll give that four stars just because... I quite like it. It's quite gentle. It's proper Sunday night, but um, you know, it, it is proper Sunday night. And what's that new thing that ITV have commissioned this week? They've uh, commissioned a lady police drama this week, haven't they? Yeah, I think that's based know, on. Books but I can't called, remember what it is. Yeah, I think it's called. The books are called Metropolitan. I think and Patrick Harbinson, the writer, is doing the adaptation. Mm. So I expect. That'll be a little bit grittier. I read some of the synopsis and it starts with someone falling off a six story building. So I'm like. <laughs> <laughs> well, as long as they don't. What was that series? Oh, The Chief with, um, oh God, that American guy in it. Uh, it's on ITV. And I think someone fell off a, a wind turbine. That was quite exciting. So oh, the it's, one it's sitting, a long way to go to beat the chief. With that, oh, I quite like that. Someone on a wind turbine. Again, that was that was quite different, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, well, let's be, I mean, there's something gritty, Unforgotten. I mean, I know you're a great lover of Unforgotten. I really think this is a cracking series, this one. I, I think it's actually the best so far because we we know about the lead characters. And I think, you know, it's always special mention for Sonny's backpack. Wherever he goes, he's got the backpack with him. So, so well done. And I'm surprised it hasn't been spoiled. But um, it's it's just fabulous the way Chris Lang unfolds the drama, doesn't he? With all the you know, with all the possible murderers, it's 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 genius. I've never seen anything like it. Have you? 
Oh, no. So is he your Desert Island crime writer, then? Your crime screenwriter for Take Off of the Desert Island? He is, oh, he is very good, because these, because these are original these are original stories. He does craft them and pace them so well, doesn't he? Mm. I mean, people underestimate pace in the... Yesterday's... Sorry. Absolutely. I'm just talking to you on Twitter. Is that... Can you hear me now, Martha? <laughs> yeah, I was talking back. to you on Twitter, and I said... <laughs> Uh, on Twitter, I said, are your walls full of post-it notes in the office? You know, because the plotting is so intricate. And he said, no, I've just they just fizz around in my mind and I write them down. You know, and I said, well, you know, you have a very big brain because they are very intricate because, you know, effectively you're ha your the details of all the all the sort of ex coppers in this. Their personal lives are in such amazing detail, aren't they? We see them at home. We see them you know, in business, we see them with their partners, you know, they're just amazing character studies. Uh, and then you layer on to the police, um, police people and their families. It's just extraordinary, absolutely extraordinary. It is. And um, I'd like to see a little bit more detail from about Sanjeev's character, though, because last episode, he was meant to help with the moving and didn't do that. So I was a bit disappointed we didn't get a little bit more about, I don't know, his wife being very cross that he wasn't involved. But um, Nicola's character is very interesting because there's a lot going on there, isn't there? I mean, her own struggles with mental health, of course, and wanting to sort of leave the police and not being able to because of the pension, which was another one of those sort of rather banal <laughs> details, which was absolutely brilliant. I thought, yeah. And I thought, God, every police officer were going, yes, absolutely, this has happened to me. Uh, he's brilliant, Lang, the way he can sort of touch on those tiny issues, I think. Mm, mm. It's brilliant. I mean, I'd like to see a lot more of Peter Egan as well as, as her father, who's uh, going to be going downhill with dementia fairly shortly. But, I mean, I think this is a role when you're an actor over 65, isn't it? It's, you know, unless you're in Last Tango in Halifax, it is your role to die or develop a terrible illness. But, you know, Peter Egan's, you know, he's still hot. And I'd, I'd just like to see Chris Lang, you know, write another series of Peter Egan where he plays a man who, who's sort of nice and doesn't die. But he is such a great actor, um, is, you know, yeah. he, and he, he plays it in an understated fashion. Um, but, yeah, I would too would like to see more of Sonny's family because I think we just saw his partner tutting and rearranging some shelves. I know, so I, he, love those. You know, I, love those. Biggest, I love those. I love those little... Most of the biggest I... relationship he has with, is with his backpack, I don't know. But there's two great, two other great performances. I think um, Sheila Hancock's performance in it is fantastic oh. as the as the mother upstairs being cared for in the house, and then her, her daughter Susan Lynch, who's going to be chief constable, one of the suspects, and they have this sort of completely explosive relationship, don't they? And Sheila Hancock's oh. telephone oh. in the first episode. You know, I just you know something about you know I, I respect you. All. You've got you've got something balls she said to her which i thought was fantastic but sort of growled it down the telephone as well yeah actually you know i mean it, she's the sort of actress you just look at her looking out the window at susan lynch cycling off to work as a policewoman and go oh the face on that oh you know she's she's you know there's but that's we but we don't know about we know they've got a bad relationship we, we wondered why and we're just gagging to find out about it um and Andy Nyman's fantastic as well, isn't he? He's a suspect who's got the um, son with learning disabilities. And, you know, he's a, he's a great guy, but he's also, as we know, a people smuggler. Absolutely. Um, yeah, the, other point. the other detective who's a suspect as well. I mean, it is, it is incredible to get these two things, that and upcoming line of duty, which deal with police corruption, isn't it? And for both of these things to be arriving at the moment when other cases are going on in real life, which we shouldn't really mention, but it is it is sort of timely as well, rather bizarrely. Mm. Mm -hmm. I mean, what do we think line of duty is going to deliver? I mean, I, I just, I to be honest, there's so much telly on now that I, I kind of forget what happens. So I've reacquainted myself with all the new series of line of duty. And I think I've still forgotten what's what's happened. So I I, I wait with the last series, the trepidation, because I I know I'll just be going, who's that? And but were they in that last series? And have they had a facelift? Um, but there are a lot of I, I, 
there are a lot of detectives I have, around. I mean, and I have, I have, I have seen the first episode of the next series of Lion Beauty, and of course, I can't say anything about it, but um, it is was absolutely. It, was it good, David? It was very good. Did you enjoy and, uh, it? It's a, I think it was an easy five stars, really. I did, I did enjoy it, and I was completely taken in. Again, I mentioned pace in police thrillers, and, and Jed Mercurio just knows how to pace these thrillers so brilliantly. But I, if I keep talking about it, I'll say something and give away. I mean, the list of spoilers <laughs> is as long as three arms, basically. So I don't say anything more about it, but I do recommend it, and we'll, we'll chat about that next week, really, won't we? Oh, next week, how exciting. Oh, great. But no, for me at the moment, Unforgiven is just the right pace and it's just very human. That's what I really like about it. You know, we do see people's foibles and we understand them. And I think Chris Lang is a brilliant writer on that level. Um, and this is why I'm not surprised he writes quite a lot for sort of European TV. You know, he's, he's got a French series on Netflix. You know, he's got a He's got a real supernatural understanding of how the human heart works, and that's what makes him so terrific. Absolutely, I think. Well, I, well, we'll give that five stars and just hope it continues. Yeah, the easy brilliant. five stars. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Right. Maybe next. We'll, where, should we, where should we go? Where should we go now? We go to Heathrow next. Do you know, I haven't watched Britain's Heathrow. But we haven't airport. watched Heathrow, but I mean that doesn't mean we can't talk about Heathrow. <laughs> Well, it doesn't matter, David, because it's just a nice programme about Heathrow, Britain's busiest airport, not being busy during a pandemic. Was, um, it, des I mean, uh, was it deserted, though? Was that the whole point? It was quite deserted. There was lots, quite a lot of stuff about people um, with, with steam things, um, cleaning things, and a woman going missing, and she turned out to be this fella's wife and not his sister. And it was narrated by um, Judy Walters. And I wouldn't watch it again because it was a bit dull. Sorry, I, I think I, but it I, was... think, I think based on that recommendation, I will watch it because I thought the appeal was going to be that, oh, here's a deserted, you know, hit the too busy airport. Wouldn't it be great to be back there? And everyone going, God, don't you remember the time when we turned up there and went to you know, Costa Coffee and had that wonderful <laughs> cappuccino before we flew out and we left your toothbrush yeah, that, at home, that all breakfast this sort of stuff. beer, yeah. But no, it's, I mean, it, you can see it's a schedule filler, basically. There's, there's so little factual stuff, I guess, that people have been able to make that, you know, it was probably a quick turnaround thing for ITV. And um, it was, you know, put it this way, it was no airport you know there wasn't there weren't people turning up free to jet flights going you sod you bleep 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 you know my flight's gone and you wouldn't let me on i i don't know how they're gonna how they're gonna pad it out for the next few weeks but if it's you victory, if you like a, sort of it's a victory like for the PRs at Heathrow. Victory, victory for the prs at Heathrow, isn't it to get this yeah show plucky on. little plucky little airport carrying on under pressure bless them narrated by judy walters uh which is nice so again okay, it's two and a half stars from me and you can't give it any because you haven't watched it i'm not going to give it any but I'll, watch, I'll watch it next week under sufferance now i mean i'll go I'll, i will give it a go um i mean we're talking about formats that have been done under the duress of the pandemic. I mean, I reckon worst of the week, we're going to give a worst of the week, is the best house mm. in town. Did you watch Best House in Town at daytime? It's it's just it's just another one of those shows, isn't it? It's just like um, pick one word. Uh, you've got the word how you've got best you've got the competitive element you've got lots of you know you've got a commissioning editor going lots of people and looking to move out of london blah 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 it's just another one it's an, you know there's so many great shows about houses why watch this other one no not not for me no i think it was i think it was a really cheap show i mean it really um i couldn't i couldn't believe we we're having yet another format I mean, we're running out. I mean, the previous week we had a thing set, set in a town as well. I think it was uh, Stratford upon Avon, and they were choosing houses there. I mean, this is just another sliver of the same format, really. And five people going around various houses. The first one they went into was a railway cottage. And one of the people said, Oh, it hasn't got underfloor heating. I thought, Well, I bet your house hasn't got underfloor heating either. I mean, 
<laughs> it struck me as the pettiest criticism when they probably didn't have it. You know, they're walking to every house with their shoes off and going, oh, God, where's your underfloor heating? I mean... In, in a railway cottage as well. I mean, it's not as if, you know, some sort of 18th century, you know, guard person like the railway chalk, isn't it? But as you say, I think people should be aware of what, what's been commissioned under lockdown. Because, you know, all of a sudden these dr big dramas just came to an end and everyone's gone, crikey O'Reilly, what can we fill the schedules with? And I have, I have seen some commissioning documents and what they're looking for is literally homely programmes, people that make people feel good under lockdown, people that, you know, that they think that people go, oh, you know, when lockdown's over, I'll move house, blah, blah, blah. But um, there's not a great deal of imagination, which is a shame because there's good stuff in daytime, isn't there? There is. I mean, I caught the, caught the first episode of um, Moving On, which the Jimmy McGovern authored series, yeah. which I think was absolutely brilliant. I mean, this, this, the first episode centred on a fellow who was meant to be dead and came back <laughs> 20 years later to visit his son at his wedding, which was wonderful for his mother as well and she was there and went round a pillar in the church and saw him sitting there and I mean I thought she would have reacted you know more severely than she did but in the end the father and the son had a fight in the graveyard I haven't seen a fight in a graveyard rolling around on their dead daughter's grave it was absolutely <laughs> It was Fantastic. Jimmy, Jimmy McGovern never changes, does he? He's not, he's not more delicate for daytime, apart from the language. So, I mean, five stars for that, definitely. I mean, that is a quality series for daytime, whereas, I mean, I've drifted in and out of Doctors, literally, which I find mm. quite, <laughs> quite hard going, really. So Yeah, um, well, it's, it, I find that quite hard going too. But I mean, the great thing about doctors is I understand the BBC sort of almost use it as like a sort of, you know, um, a greenhouse for nurturing new writers and production talent. So, you know, doctors does kind of serve its purpose. But yeah, everybody in it is quite irritating. You know, they sort of want a day off for something and then they bring in the police and it, it is... It is quite irritating, I'm afraid, but yeah. you know it serves its purpose. Ditto Father Brown as well, which is which is nice because it's got fifties frocks in and some good guest stars. Yeah, we like we like a man in a cassock, basically. So we oh, like everyone loves a man in a cassock. Who doesn't? Man in a cassock. That sounds like an ITV three thing with them um, from 1964, doesn't it? Starring uh, um, Very Roger Moore. <laughs> Man in a cassock, man <laughs> in a suitcase, man I mean, I on had, some concrete. Did you did you catch any of the Carolina Hearn at the BBC? Uh, no, I thought that was an object lesson in how to do a tribute programme, because we've had, haven't we, so many Victoria Wood tributes. And um, I didn't mind the series on Victoria Wood where her friends talked about her work, but there was a Victoria Wood tribute where they brought in some academics to talk about her work. And I thought it was completely unnecessary. But in the Carolina Hearn, we had John Thompson, you know, appearing again after he was in McDonald and Dodd, um, just introducing some lovely clips and offering some proper insight into Carolina's person. Yeah, absolutely. And we saw her doing stand up, which I don't think I've ever seen. You know, so there were there were quite long clips of her doing stand up and she was an absolute natural at that, wasn't she? We, we were so used to seeing her in the royal family and then she pops up in stand up. I, mm. I loved it. I loved it. You're right. Great insight from uh, John Thompson, who obviously was very close to her. But seeing, but 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 interesting seeing those older clips of the royal family. It doesn't date at all, does it? You can drop into the royal family at any point, and you'll still get a brilliant laugh out of it, won't you? Always. And I mean, the bit that they finished the program with, which was. Um... Oh God! It was Barbara and Jim and uh, and their mate, whose name I've temporarily forgotten. They they're decorating and they're dancing to Manbone Number Five. Yeah, and it was everything, wasn't it? It was physical comedy. It was a great little song, and you understood their characters from the way they started dicking about whilst dancing to number Mamba number five whilst getting some wallpaper off. It was the fun in these people and the warmth in the characters, you know, 
we love the royal family. We, we, we still love them. We always will. But it was just amazing, wasn't it, how that simple scene just made us feel everything about the royal family. The woman was a genius, wasn't she? Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant writer. I mean, they did, well, unfortunately, there wasn't a clip of the garage sitcom that she wrote while she was out in Australia for a spell, which um, I should have looked up the title of it, but I haven't. But <laughs> I'll, I'll, ladies and gentlemen, I'll bring it with me next week. But I mean, this yeah, it'll only, be available I'm, on the non-existent website, David. Yeah. I mean, there was just, it was a fantastic little series. It was, it was, I don't know if it was a full series. It might have been four episodes set in a Bondi garage. And um, how and why it was conceived and commissioned, I don't know, but it was, a, it was, it was quite a gem. So it's nice to end on a royal family, isn't it? Really, we've gone from one royal family. Absolutely, we've gone from one royal family to the other. Um, I'm just trying to look up the, um, the Australian series. Because it, is this is crucial. We need to we need to know. It is crucial. I'm afraid I I I, I can't um I can't unless uh, it was I just can't. a figment of my imagination thing. Gosh, I wish. No, I'm like sure it was a thing because, because I mean it was almost one of those things. Oh, Dossa and Joe. Dossa and Joe. There we are. Yeah, which was screened on BBC Two in 2002. And did not return for a second series. So there you go. <laughs> that must have been my influence. <laughs> yes, obviously. But yes, we've gone seamlessly from one set of royals to the other. And I think I'd sort of prefer Jim and Barbara and um, asking her what I've had, if I've had my tea yet. Yeah. Than Harry and Megan. Absolutely. So on that note, we've been watching a lot of wonderful things and they're all on various catch up devices, <laughs> aren't they? Indeed they are, and other catch-up devices are available, etc. Well, same time next week then, David. Yeah, absolutely, and uh, happy viewing. Happy viewing.